recital and we don't mention the word I in this discourse that we recite every day. If you listen to it, you will see the wording is so full of love. Let us begin. May all beings be happy and secure. May all beings have happy minds. Whatever living beings there may be, without exception, weak or strong, long, large, medium, short, subtle or gross, visible or invisible, living near or far, born or coming to birth, may all beings have happy minds. Let no one deceive another, nor despise anyone anywhere, neither from anger nor ill will, should anyone wish harm to another. As a mother who risks her own life to protect her only child, even so, towards all living beings, one should cultivate a boundless heart. One should cultivate for all the world a heart of boundless loving friendliness, above, below, and all around, unobstructed, without hate or resentment, whether standing, walking, sitting, lying down, or whenever awake, one should develop this mindfulness this is called divinely dwelling here, not falling into erroneous views, but virtuous and endowed with vision, removing desires for sensual pleasures. One comes never again to birth in the womb. Remember, friends, in this metta recital, Buddha used the word etang satin this mindfulness. We have to be mindful of suffering beings. We must know, we know that there are millions of suffering beings and therefore metta practice must benefit all of them. With this metta thought in mind, let us cultivate our mindfulness, as just I mentioned. Mindfulness is seeing even metta is not something permanent. It comes and goes, just like the breath coming and going, feeling of the breath coming and going, perception of the breath coming and going, attention or thought of the breath coming and going, awareness and consciousness comes and go. So this is uh, inevitable, natural occurrence, natural action of event taking place all the time whether we like or not. And we have to be very clear in our mind and very sincerely, directly, and be honest to accept this reality without trying to hide it. You can never hide the reality. It is just like trying to hide the light. It shines its light. Buddha called it like the sun. When sun shines, it eliminates all shade of darkness, all pervasive impermanence, is exactly like that, all encompassing, all pervasive, everywhere we can see, including this COVID-19. And then with this awareness, we keep 
paying attention to our breath without thinking of the past or of the future just pay attention to what is happening right now this very moment when you see this universal nature there is nothing to get upset or excited everything is marked with this truth then we accept it and follows then we gain we we will see our breath becoming calm and relaxed the feeling becomes calm perception is calm thoughts subside body becomes calm mind becomes relaxed and then we gain relief of all impediments temporarily the mind becomes free from all sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair we with this few words in the form of encouragement i like to stop and let us sit together and meditate suffering may the fear stuck be free from fear may the grieving be free from grief so to me all living beings once again friends this is the very good moment for us to wish once again peace and happiness liberation from sorrow lamentation pain grief and despair of all living beings may they all have peace solace and comfort and be happy and return to their normal health and live their normal life let's have another session of uh, dhamma discussion if you have any question this is the time to ask Are there any question here? Ah. I just posted one. From, uh, from Veronique. Uh-huh. In the advice to Andatapindika, Andatapindika, the Buddha says, Householder, you should train thus. I will not cling to material form. I will not cling to feeling. I will not cling to perception. I will not cling to formations. I will not cling to consciousness. and my consciousness will not be dependent on consciousness thus you should train what does he mean by consciousness will not be dependent on consciousness thank you bhante oh. <laughs>
consciousness uh, can perpetuate more consciousness of various uh, things that have uh, desire, resentment and confusion. So must one must not become attached to such things as you read it earlier in the uh, discourse. Uh, so when uh, your mind becomes uh, non-attached or uh, not clinging to any of those things, that consciousness is called consciousness free from sankhara, conditioned things, so as somebody said, fabrications. It is called visankhara gatan chittam tanhana kaya jaga in the in Dhammapada you can see this tensa the consciousness become free from uh, sankhara sankhara certainly have uh, various uh, impurities and therefore mind should be should be free from sankhara that is called Visankara Gatanjita. Tanhana Khaima Jaga, when you are not attached to any Sankara, your craving or desire comes to an end. And therefore, uh, that Sankara, free from such attachment to another consciousness, free from and uh, any other consciousness is called uh, appanihita chitta. That means the consciousness is not established in any particular thing. That is, of course, the state of uh, enlightenment, state of uh, arahanthood. In other words, arahant consciousness is totally free from any clinging. Anath Pindika uh, cried at the end of the discourse and uh, Sariputta asked, are you uh, unhappy? Are you, uh, are you attached to any of these things? Uh, why do you cry? He said, Venerable Sir, I have been associating with the Buddha and you for so many years, but I never heard this kind of discourse. Then Sariputta said, Dhanata Pindika, this is the kind of discourse that we normally don't deliver to lay people. Mm. Then Dhanata Pindika said, please, from now on, go on delivering this kind of, this sermon to everybody. He said, even the Buddha did not give me this kind of sermon and you never gave me. This is the first time I heard and therefore this is so profound, so beneficial to everybody and therefore deliver this sermon. The way to liberate consciousness from other consciousness which is defiled or which has impurities. Okay. Thank you. Mante, there's a question here. There's a question here that's very related to what you just said. We think it's very fitting that it was just asked. Uh, Jason asks, um, where should we begin reading and studying Buddhist texts? Should we start with the Digha Nikaya or Majjhima Nikaya, perhaps with the Dhammapada or something else? <clears throat> and uh, uh, if I may, uh, for years I was reading books about Buddhism and it wasn't until within this past year that I started reading the, the actual, actual words of the Buddha. So I just wanted to contribute that, uh, that these texts are really a treasure trove and uh, so um, anyway. Uh, I think... Uh... Uh, 
you can start with any text translated into English. You may read. It is, it is difficult even for me to tell you which text you should start with because each text uh, contains a very profound, very important message. If you uh, like, uh, you may start with uh, uh, Madhyaman Nikaya, uh, Middle Length Discourse. It is uh, translated by various people, various monks. Uh, some you can download from internet. Some you can find a paper book uh, available in the market. Middle Length Discourses of the Buddha is one that is available. And or Connected Discourses of the Buddha, that is Sangyutta Nika translation, and uh, Numerical Discourses of the Buddha, that is Anguttara Nikaya translation. Uh, the Long Discourses of the Buddha, that is Diga Nikaya. I would not recommend people to start with Diga Nikaya because it is more uh, deep or deeper uh, and long discourses. Uh, another uh, book that came out last year is uh, uh, Sangyutta, what, what you call Sutta Nipata, also is a very good, wonderful translation. Uh, it is called the Sutta Nipata, an ancient collection of Buddhist discourses. And all these are available. You may start with Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length discourses of the Buddha. And the first discourse in the Majjhima Nikaya seems to be a little uh, difficult. And many people recommend new comers to read in these books to skip the first, uh, first discourse. Uh, but if you start with the second, it would be very good. The first is difficult because it is given to monks and it is called the root of all dhammas, which is difficult unless you have a good teacher to expound it. Okay. Another question, uh, Monte from uh, Peter is, uh, Monte, would you please explain the difference between a non-returner and an arahant? Okay, non-returner, he is called the one who has uh, uh, overcome five lower fetters. Arahant has overcome all the fetters. Arahant is, uh, he overcomes uh, subtle fetters. Nagami or non return overcome all gross fetters. Uh, altogether, there are 10 fetters. So, Anagami, once again, I must say, overcome, has overcome the gross fetters, fetters very heavy down to earth, and around. Uh, has overcome the remaining five subtle fetters. So it is a matter of destroying fetters that make the difference. Okay. 
Anyone, uh, would anyone like to verbally ask a question? Yeah. Okay. Um, Bonte, I have a question. I yeah. was, oh, sorry. Um, hi, Bonte. I was reading in the Anguttara, Anguttara Nikaya in the book number four, a Janu Sonan said to the Buddha, I hold that there is no one who is not afraid of death. And the Buddha said, no, there are these four persons who are not afraid of death. One who is abandoned craving for the body, another abandoned craving for uh, sensuality, another who has abandoned um, uh, confusion, uh, in the Dhamma, and um, another who uh, has done what is skillful. I was wondering if you could tell us more about abandoning the fear of death. Abandoning fear of death is abandoning. It is uh, uh, only when one sees impermanence exactly as it is and then knowing that this body is fragile and therefore if every he that person uh, thinks contemplates the changes impermanent nature of this body feeling perception thoughts and consciousness. Seeing this changing all the time, one would not have fear of death. Because in very uh, deeper sense of the word, we are dying every moment and taking rebirth every moment. That is happening Literally, every cell in our body dies, new cell arises. Every moment we breathe in, we bring oxygen to renew new cells, uh, to replace new cells. Uh, not the oxygen itself uh, generate uh, cells, but uh, the body has, uh, body dies many, many cells every moment. And therefore, when we breathe in, the cells remaining become renewed and get uh, charged with oxygen. And the death is taking place in us all the time. Once we see this in meditation, or if one uh, uh, very wisely think that the death is inevitable, we may not be afraid of death. People are afraid of not the death, but the manner they will spend their last uh, part of their life. They like, don't like to be bedridden. They don't like to be fed by others, uh, clean and so forth. And that would be very unpleasant, agonizing experience. That is what they don't like but not the death itself. So we can be free from fear of death by seeing the truth, but we cannot get rid of the fear of being bedridden and uh, unable to do our own things and uh, always in pain. That is what people are afraid of. Otherwise, Overcoming the fear of death is not that difficult. Thank you, Bhante. Okay. Now, you're welcome. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Any more questions? We have 10 more minutes. Hmm. I have a fun one for yeah. you, Bhante. Yes. Uh, 
I wrote how to get out of bed more quickly in the morning. Sloth often prevails. Thoughts often prevail. Sloth. Sloth. Yes. Yes. It is very true. Uh, I don't think we have to force to get out of bed very quickly because during the night when we are lying down and sleeping, there will remain some amount of uh, carbon dioxide in our brain and that makes us drowsy and sleepy and therefore when we wake up we have to wait in bed for few minutes to get rid of our uh, carbon dioxide in the brain and to wake us up fully. So while lying in bed, you can, when you, when you are awake, uh, in order to make yourself quite fully awake, you may massage your legs and hands and that also is a very little exercise. Uh, while in the bed and then we will be very uh, alert and get up without having this uh, drowsiness, sleepiness and uh, so on. And that's what I would suggest. Thank you, Pante. You're welcome. Um, Doug, Doug writes, uh, why are there so many trillions of lives? It can seem scary to think we will cycle endlessly through so many lives. It can seem like an overwhelming task. Is this what Sam, Samvega means to spur us to practice? Yes, exactly. Samvega means uh, seeing the nature of existence in samsara and suffering and endlessness of samsara uh, we accelerate our practice and that urge arising in our mind depending on the amount of beings on, in the universe, that urge uh, prompts us to do more practice more vigorously, more, more often in order to be free from such repetition of birth and death. And that is called Dhamma Sangvega. So he is right. Uh, the Sangsara, Buddha said, uh, is the beginning Anamata Goyambike Sangsara Pubba Kodana Panyati Avijjaja Bhavatannaja because the beginning of samsara is indiscernible because of ignorance and craving. So nobody knows when ignorance started and when craving started. And uh, when we are born, they are there. And therefore, Buddha's advice is to uh, intelligent people that when you, if, when you know this, that the beginning is indiscernible, you can start right now to end this cycle. You end is discernible because we can see if the greed and hatred, ignorance are uh, greed, hatred and delusion are there, we must try to get rid of greed to end it. We must try to get rid of hatred to get to come to an end. And then we must try to get rid of delusion so that we can end this repetition of birth and death. But we don't know when they started. Now we are we have them now and we can see the way to get rid of them. Once we are gone, then this cycle will come to an end right there. And therefore, we have to accelerate our practice and seeing this, 
uh, is called Dhamma Sangvega, and then we apply our effort to liberate ourselves and practice. You want another one? Uh, yeah. Okay. What is the difference in understanding of impermanence in different stages of realization of the truth? Is impermanence understood at a deeper level as you proceed? Yes. Yes. Deeper, uh, the uh, impermanence you understand in the subtlest way to see that there is no uh, uh, lasting entity, binding entity that can control anything. Uh, there is no such thing. To be able to see this reality, you must see impermanence in the subtlest way as you keep practicing, as your mindfulness and attainment of liberation increases, then you will see this reality more clearly and then your mind will be free from any notion of uh, uh, self, permanent self. One more. Okay. All right. I think this is uh, the last question for the day, for the morning. Yeah. Bhante, does our practice experience stack up like a card deck with our time and practice? And if up and return, are we now at the bottom of the metaphorical deck? Sometimes time away from practice has proven to be fruitful when I return. Uh, sometimes hard. Uh, sometimes time away from practice has p proven to be fruitful when I return to practice. Yeah. Yes. I, uh, I, I think he, I think he's asking if if we need to consistently practice or if we can take breaks, uh, extended breaks from practice, and if it makes a difference in our progression. Uh, you, the moment you become un, unmindful, uh, you have a break from the practice. It happens naturally. I would not, uh, uh, you can have a break from everything else, but uh, try not to have any break from the practice of mindfulness. Uh, because the more you, more you are mindful, quicker is your liberation. Uh, you may uh, have breaks from all other secular things, but let this incorporate with all our secular things and be mindful uh, as far as you can. Sometimes it happens that you may be unmindful. Uh, that is uh, inevitable. That is not... Uh, that happens inadvertently, but deliberately don't try to be unmindful. Okay. What What if he was referring to like seated meditation practice? Seated meditation practice you cannot do forever. That is why we have standing, walking, lying down, mm. other postures as well. Uh, so these four postures are like uh, uh, four wheels of a vehicle. Mm. When you balance uh, the vehicle, you have to balance all the four wheels. Mm. Wheel, wheel, uh, if you want, uh, wheel, one tire is punctured, if it doesn't work, you may have to replace all the four tires. Otherwise, uh, the vehicle may not uh, be functioning very smoothly. Similarly, when you practice meditation, sitting is good. Sit as long as you can, then do other practice meditation in other postures as well, so that you will have a balance. So I do want to. <laughs> okay. So we'll see you all at 7 p.m. Thank you, Bhante. Yes. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante. Thank you, Bhante.
Thank you, Bonte. Thank you, Bonte. Thank you, Bonte. Sadhu. 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 So brilliant. So brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Bonte. Thank you.